Today I want to talk to you about uh, a message I've called Come and See. Come and See. And you're certainly in a season like that as you reach out to uh, friends and invite them to become a part of this community of faith. And we have an opportunity today to spend just a little bit of time kind of zooming in on the life of Jesus to be mentored by the master, even in the day that we're living in, to see what effective evangelism looks like, what effective discipleship looks like, uh, because if there's anybody that I want to learn from, it's him, right? We, we know his effectiveness. Uh, we, we read about it. We see changed lives, and we are still being changed today. Now, come and see means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For the skeptics and the seekers, come and see means to come and to think, to examine the evidence, to to experience the hope of Christ for ourselves. Uh, For Christ followers, for many of us, come and see means to to go a little deeper, to grow in our faith, to to grow as disciples. It's really a call to faith and and not just for salvation. How many know we need him like every moment of the day? Uh, I was reminded of that as I was back on the 401 again this morning. I thought on Sunday morning it would be peaceful. No, man. It was, we were back at it, but I felt, I felt at home. We were here for about five years, uh, pioneering a church in the East York area, so we're familiar with the city. We love this city. Uh, I was picking up some food the other day, and the, the, the Leafs were playing. And for just a minute, as everybody was losing their mind, you know, in this overtime moment and scoring a goal, I forgot all about the Canucks for a split second. And I was going, yes! And I'm like, what's happening to me? It doesn't take long to slide back in to those old ways. You know, God's called us to the kind of overflowing life, the kind of abundance that can only be found in him. And if we're open to the Spirit's leading in our lives, I believe that today we can still be changed by the same power that Jesus displayed in his ministry on earth so that you and I can in turn say, come and see to others that have yet to experience what God is doing. And the best way sometimes to show people what you're talking about beyond even quoting chapter and verse, and that's important, is to demonstrate the life of Christ within you so that people want to see it working within you. They don't just want to see a a concept you say, oh, you know, watch me on Sunday. That's the day that I love the Lord. That's the day that I'm excited. That's the day I'm singing song. Don't talk to me on Monday. I'm an angry person on Monday, right? We need to see that kind of consistency every day that we live. You know, whenever my wife and I have an opportunity to take a little vacation, a little holiday, and to get some rest, we tend to be the same uh, way in the morning. Like, she's very different in the morning than I am, right? She's up with the sun, hot coffee in hand. If we're a place where there's water, she wants to see the sunrise, right? Like she wants to experience every moment. I'm going so much so long every day that when I get on vacation, I just want to relax a little bit. So I tend to kind of sleep in a little bit. And so every time it seems to be the same time uh, and the same moment all the time repeating itself, uh, after I wake up, she'll usually tell me, oh, you, you couldn't believe the sunrise this morning. It was spectacular. Like, you got to see it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, well, uh, maybe tomorrow, baby. Maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll get up and have a look. Today I just need a little bit of rest. So the next day comes, and I can hear her as I kind of am half awake and half asleep, and I can hear her saying, get up. Get up and come see this. You've got to see this. It's spectacular. And so like the good husband that I am, I muster up the energy and I sit up in the bed and I'm like, oh yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> and then back, back out I go. Now usually on the third day, and I know that sounds very biblical, but that's, that's not really the reason, but, but on the third day, usually I can hear her again saying, come on, come and see this. It's even better than it was yesterday. And so I finally, I get out of bed, I pull a little chair over by the window, and and we experience the sunrise together. It's a romantic moment, right? And I'm always glad that I did because it's, it's spectacular. Like it's just, you see the beauty of God's creation as that 
that light kind of shimmers on the ocean. It's just spectacular. One time I had the opportunity a number of years ago to travel with a group of pastors to Israel. And we were staying at this place uh, on the Sea of Galilee. And it was incredible just to kind of walk through these areas that we read about. And, and so in the early morning, I was still struggling with jet lag, and so I was waking up at a really odd time, and, uh, but I could hear, Susan wasn't with me on this trip, but I could hear her voice in the back of my mind saying, get up, come and see this. And so I fight my way in the dark, and I look out the window, and it's not the greatest view, so I open the door to my room, and I find my way up to the roof of the place that I'm staying. And there in the darkness, I'm all alone, and I wait, and I wait. And then I can see the sun just kind of show itself, and there's like a shimmer across the water. And there in that moment, I can see the fishermen, you know, getting their boats ready, getting their nets ready. And it strikes me that that this is likely a picture of, of what Jesus himself probably saw when he woke up early in the morning to pray. And it was like a little overwhelming because there I am all by myself kind of tearing up and and experiencing this moment. And it was a God moment. But I can remember and still hear her voice saying, "Some come and see. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 1. Let's look at verses 43 through 46. It says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael, his friend, and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. His response, Nazareth, you've got to be kidding me. Can anything good come from Nazareth, Nathanael asked. Come and see said Philip, come and see. Now the Gospel of John is this wonderful first-hand account of what John and the disciples were experiencing in the moment that they were in. And it helps us, I think, get a better grasp on what reaching out and, and evangelizing truly looks like, what discipleship looks like, what that growth process should be. And John's purpose in, in writing this book was to provoke faith in Jesus, resulting in eternal life, that you may believe. But that could also be translated that you may continue to believe, because surely in this moment, he was speaking to those that didn't believe and wanting them to believe, but he was also encouraging the new believers who were still kind of struggling in their newfound faith, and so he wanted to strengthen them in what they were hearing. Come and see Evangelism was never meant to be just about inviting people to our church, to get people to belong or believe a certain set of of spiritual laws or principles. It is and always has been about introducing people to the living reality of Jesus. The answer to today's problems, to all the craziness that we're seeing, is still Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So come and see. What does that mean exactly? Well, firstly, I think it means that that when we come and see, we need to challenge people to come and think for themselves, to examine the evidence, to not be afraid to to ask questions. You know, when I first started following Christ, I asked so many questions, I drove people crazy. Literally, I think people crossed to the other side of the church when they saw me coming because I had more questions. And they'd answer one, and that would lead to a new one. I was just constantly asking questions because I had a spiritual hunger in my heart, but I also wanted to understand. And so in this moment, when Nathaniel shot back and challenged Philip after he told him about Jesus, he said, Nazareth, can anything good come from that place? Can anything good come from Surrey or, or North York? Can anything good come from those parts of the area that we live in? But you know what? I think it's interesting that Philip didn't get defensive. He didn't rebuke him or try to defend who Jesus was. Instead, he encourages him and he challenges him to come and see for himself. 
He was engaging him where he was. He was engaging him and encouraging him to, to think about it. You know, I think we all realize that old school religion demands compliance and acceptance and oftentimes discourages questions. I grew up in a very traditional church. I mean, I went because I was dragged there. I didn't have an option. It was something that my family did out of tradition or obligation, and it had less to do with the relationship with Christ and more to do with, with just a, a need to do what was right. But what was missing was, was that life. And oftentimes, religion will push you into that place. But in G this case, Jesus is inviting them to engage their hearts to engage their thinking, to ask those kind of questions. You see, when John's disciples started following Jesus, Jesus actually turned around and said, what are you doing? Like, you'd think that would be a given. He, they're following Jesus. But he's like, what are you guys doing? Like, I want you to think about what you're doing. Don't just go along with the crowd. Actually understand the step that you're taking. In John 1, verses 38 through 39, they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now Jesus responds, come, he replied, and you will see. Now he's inviting them. In other words, he was saying, come and see what I say. Come and see how I, I live. Spend time with me. Spend time and get to know who I am. Jesus wasn't just demanding their obedience and saying, you've got to do what I'm telling you to do. He had just met them. He was saying, come and walk with me. Come and spend some time with me. You see, obedience to his word follows teaching them truth as disciples. But first, he invites them to come and to think and not to be afraid of doing that. I think they were likely a little nervous, this new teacher, but they trusted, ultimately trusted John. And if John was giving his stamp of approval, then they said, okay, we're going to follow him. You see, they wanted to see if what they were hearing about this man was true for themselves. Now, maybe you're talking to someone today, a friend or a neighbor, about church, about Jesus. Maybe they're like modern-day Nathaniels. Maybe some of you are, are modern-day Nathaniels, and you're here today asking some of those same questions. Maybe you're not entirely convinced, but someone has invited you to come. Now, you likely won't be asking the same question that, that they were in that day, but there's people asking questions today saying, Christianity, like, like how can you believe in, in, in a, a merciful God when we can see everything that's going on in the world today? How can you, how can you kind of uh, come to grips with all the injustice that we're facing today? But what does Jesus say to you in those moments? Not what religion says, but because religion often gets it wrong. What does Jesus say to you? He's not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your wondering. He's got love and compassion. And he makes you feel that you can come and process that with a community of faith. He doesn't say to you what woke spirituality uh, is saying today, which is you just do you. You just do what's, what's good for you and, and, and make your own path. No, Jesus says, come and think. Come and follow me. Come and see for yourselves. Examine the evidence. He's not saying what old religion says, which is, how dare you challenge me? How dare you ask me a question? You just have to believe what I say to you. Listen, I've met people like that, and, and we don't spend too much time together with that kind of attitude. That's not the love of Christ. That's not how we are going to engage this community that you're in today. We've got to encourage them to come, to ask questions, to feel at home. You know, that's why I love our next generation leaders, these young men and women who are leading our students today. You know, my beginnings, as Pastor Paul mentioned earlier, uh, was in student ministry. And I believe that some of the most effective senior pastors today are the student ministries of, of days gone by. I will forever have a heart for this next generation. And I salute the young men and women who are leading them today and encouraging questions among that group. Because listen, as parents, your example and your faith will forever be a strength and a foundation for your children, but it's not enough. 
They need to have a faith for themselves. At some point, they will need to make that commitment, and they will under, need to understand why they're making it. So when the wind blows and, and the pushback happens, and it will come, they need to be able to stand on a, a sure footing because of what they believe, not just what you believe. And we need to make sure that we're training that generation to do that because they're not going to survive on the faith of their parents. They have to survive and live on the things that they know to be true. Now, we don't have the same liberty today that, that John's disciples did back then. It would be great if we could go over to Jesus' house this afternoon, right, and, and spend some time, have lunch together. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And, and back in that day, they could find Jesus physically, and spend some time with them. And Jesus could say, you know what, come with me. Come and see where I'm staying. Come and let's break bread together. But we can't do that. But we can have a, a firsthand account like the book of John, where he's not just speaking about legend. He's not just talking about inspirational truth. He's talking about this is what I saw. This is the day I saw it. This is how it happened. This was his firsthand account. And now you and I have the opportunity to say, come and see, not just what is being read in Scripture, but what is happening in our lives. Never, ever underestimate the value and the strength of your story. Your testimony, incredibly powerful. I can never tell your story like you can tell your story. And if you want people to lean forward in their seat and listen to you and engage with what they're saying, then tell them what happened to you. Tell them how God has moved within you. Because in my life, that's how some of those, that's how I moved from some of the questioning to the experience that I had with Christ, was by seeing him at work in the lives of other pe people. Because listen, when we read it, it's either all true or none of it's true. And in the end, it's a leap of faith. You need to step into it. So John's saying, come and see, read my account. Come and experience what I have experienced. The second thing that come and see means is to come and follow. You see, our lives are changed during the, the process of the following. You understand what I'm saying? It's during that following time that we learn more about ourselves, that we learn more about God. We begin to recognize his voice when he's speaking to us. And the word come simply means to, to move from where you're at to this new place. But you've got to make a change. You've got to make a decision to step out. And the reason Jesus says come is because he wants them to, to follow him. He doesn't just want them to believe. He wants them to step out, to move in the right direction. So when you make Sunday an important part of your week when it comes to your faith and your understanding of who God is, that's a part of that following, to engage by taking a step for the development of your faith. As a matter of fact, the first time that John the Baptist says to them in verse 29, he says, look, this is the Lamb of God. Like, you'd think that, that they'd listen to their teacher and be blown away by that. But the Bible says that it wasn't until the next day, in verse 36 through 37, that he had to say it again. Look, you, it's the Lamb of God. I've already said this to you, but you guys need to understand what I'm saying. You see, he was patient with them. He was patient with them as they processed what they were seeing and hearing. In your understanding of Scripture and your understanding of what God has done in your life, as you reach out to people, as you invite, invite them to, to Willowdale, as you invite them to come, you need to be patient with people as they process the things that they're hearing. You're in the most wonderful place this morning because you're surrounded by people who are processing what we're hearing about Jesus, what we're reading in Scripture, what we're being taught together. Through small groups and connections, we can, we can walk through those moments and grow together. And it's so important that we do. Here again, in, in 35 to 37, he says, the next day John was again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by. He said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him, they followed him. How many know that it's God's timing in our life that makes all the difference in the world? You can't sell Jesus to somebody like a vacuum cleaner. 
These are all the great features. This is, this is the deal that's happening only today. If you make this commitment, we'll throw in this, this uh, sharp Ginsu knife as well if you make the commitment today. Listen, you can't sell Jesus like you're on a used car lot. It has to be by his spirit using you. The timing has to be right. That's why even though on one day he's saying, look, it's the Lamb of God, they're like, yeah, yeah. And then it was like the next day, look, the Lamb of God. Whoa, it's the Lamb of God. Like suddenly they, they actually understood, right? You see, today I talk to people from, from all different walks of life, people that, that think Jesus is a good guy. But how many know there's a big difference between a fan and a follower, right? Jesus has a lot of fans out there, but he doesn't quite have as many followers. You see, because one is interested, but the other one is invested. They've put their life behind that commitment. That's why John was trying to convey this recognition of who Jesus was. He wasn't saying, look, it's a great new teacher. We got to follow this guy. Go to his podcast. You got to listen to what this guy has to say. No, he was saying, look, it's the lamb of God. Like, open your eyes. Can you see what I'm seeing? He wants them to, to move past liking this new guy, liking this new teacher, being a fan to loving and knowing him, to becoming a follower so that he will increase and I will decrease, so that I'll walk in his ordered steps and not in my own agenda. You see, a disciple has invested their lives and then committed themselves to, to change. They don't just go to the merch table and buy the T-shirt and say, I'm a, a Jesus follower. I come and I saw and I bought the T-shirt. No, he's not. He's saying, don't just be a fan. You need to be invested and be a follower. John 1, verse 51, it says, very truly, I tell you, or literally, even better translated, amen and amen. Now, interestingly enough, the, the word amen here was an Aramaic word that means this is true. So when you say amen, you're basically saying this is true, right? And every historian, every commentator, everyone who knew ancient culture recognizes the unique use of this word here in Scripture. Amen was used to affirm and approve an account and, and accredit the words that were being spoken to another. Like someone would be preaching in the synagogue and saying good things, and then the elders would stand up at some point when they were done, and they would say, amen, right? It was like they were saying, we approve of this message. Based on our incredible knowledge and all our studying, we verify that what this person has said is true. And at some point, maybe the people would also stand up in unison and say, amen, and they would agree as well. Why? Again, it was their way of saying that they agree with the truth that was being spoken. But here's the eternally powerful thing that Jesus was saying here in verse 51. Because he wasn't saying amen at the end of what he said. He started by saying amen. And he said it twice, in case you missed it the first time. Amen, amen, and then he spoke. You see, that's very different. In the old King James, it's usually translated Verily, verily, right? But it's the same thing. But people still miss the significance here. Jesus in this moment is basically saying, listen, I'm taking away your right to decide whether or not what I'm saying is true or something that you like or follow. It's still truth. Amen and amen, and then he says it. You know it's good when Jesus is amen in himself. And he's not waiting until he's done. He's saying it even before he begins to speak, amen, amen. Listen to me. When you choose to believe what I'm saying, uh, you will know and you will change because of it. And whether or not your opinion says you like it or you don't, it doesn't change its truth. Listen, if you want to come and see and believe, all you have to do is to accept that the Bible is re reliable reporting, right? That, that this account is credible. But if you want to know Jesus in an intimate and a personal way, you've got to come and follow him and believe that what the word of God says is true, whether you like it or not. How many have read something in the scripture before and you're like, mm, I don't know, like, like is, 
I got to forgive my enemy, this guy who has just treated me horribly. I got to let that person go. I, I don't know. You know, you're lined up for a, for a concert and, and, and the Lord says, you know, the last shall be first. Well, I don't claim that scripture today. I want to be at the front of the line, not at the back of the line. Sometimes it's a bit of an upside down kingdom when you read in scripture. But Jesus sets the pace by saying this is truly the way, right? And when we refuse to accept the authority of Scripture, we're actually saying that we're going to follow our own heart instead of following Jesus. We can't pick and choose the things we like about Scripture, like we're going to a buffet. I love a little bit of that. A little bit of mercy. Oh, oh, a lot of love with some extra, you know, sauce on that. But that forgiveness, oh, that's like the, the broccoli. We're going to leave that over to the side. No, no, thank you. You sure? you? No, no, I'm good. Thank you. Right? How about some of these carrots? No, no, unless they're dipped in like candy. No, thank you. Right? Oftentimes people treat scripture like that. They're like, yeah, I like this and I like that, but I don't like this and I don't like that. See, we need to be ready throughout the reading of scripture to walk in the truth because it's the truth. And then we need to be prepared to meet people and engage them where they're at. So don't be shocked when you're talking to your friends or your coworkers or your neighbors, and they're saying things that you're not accustomed to hearing. Or maybe they're saying things that, that are driven by fear. Don't try to rebuke them. Love them. Meet them where they're at and lead them to a place where you can say, come and see the Jesus that has changed me because I used to be exactly where you were. When Jesus met the, the, the woman at the well, he didn't chastise her. He didn't get into correcting her. He met her where she was. She came for one thing and left with a new life and a new, a new flow of water that she had never counted on or expected. But we need to be ready to meet people where they are and then walk with them towards Jesus to engage them in that process. You know, I remember shortly after 9-11, uh, after the world was reeling, People were, like many of you, trying to process what we had just seen on television. And this was happening live. This wasn't a, a Hollywood fiction. This was real. And so the next day, I was out in my yard mowing the front lawn. And I looked back at the house, and I could see my wife standing in the door, and she was, like, motioning towards me. And I'm like, I'm just I'm mowing the grass, right? She's like, come here. So I turned it off, and I walked over, and she said, she, she kind of looked, she said, uh, look at our neighbor across the street. I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't know. She stand, she's been standing in her doorway for the last hour while you mowed the lawn, and she's got like a glazed look, and she's just staring at our house. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if she's okay. Maybe you should go talk to her. So I walked across the street, and, and I knew her. We, she knew that that I was a pastor in a church in the area, and I had all kinds of people in our little cul-de-sac that knew what I did for a living, and most of them were not church-going, Christ-following people. And I love having friends that don't know Jesus because it's an opportunity for the light to shine, right? And so I went over to her and I said, I, I called her name because it was like she was like, like looking like, like lost in a moment. And I said, are you okay? And she just started to convulse and cry. And she said, no, I, I'm not okay. I'm, I am terrified. Like, I am fearful for, for, for my life, for my grandchildren. If this can happen just randomly out of nowhere, planes and buildings, like, what if something just falls from the sky and crushes my house? This is horrible. I'm, I, I, I can hardly move right now. You see, it wasn't the time to to whip out my Bible and turn to a particular scripture and lead her in a Bible study. It was a moment led by the Holy Spirit to say, hey, listen, do you, you want to come over with Susan and I and spend some time with us? Yes, I'd really like that. So I said, well, come and follow me. So she came over. She came over and sat in our living room, and she just wept. And I said, she said, how, how do you deal with what has just taken place? And I said, this is this is horrible. This is incredibly sad, the, the thing that we've just seen, especially knowing that so many lives have been affected. But I said, this is how we process that fear, because fear is very real. But there's a peace 
that passes all the understanding. You know, sometimes you can quote chapter and verse without giving them the chapter and verse. You can say, there's a peace that passes all understanding that, that it doesn't make sense, but it anchors me. And she says, well, what is that? And I said, it's all about knowing Jesus. Not about a church, not about just belonging, having a membership at this place or that place. It's about knowing Jesus in a personal way, knowing the Prince of Peace, because he's the only one that's gonna walk us through this mess and get us to the other side. And there in my living room, I had the opportunity with Susan and I to lead her to Jesus. She said, I need that peace. I desperately need that peace. I said, well, you can have it right now. Let's pray together. Let's, let's ask Jesus to come into this moment so that you will be forever changed. And there in that moment, her life, the trajectory of the path she was on was forever changed. She moved from a place of terror and fear to a place of peace, all because she said yes. Yeah, amen. The last thing that, that come and see means is to come and grow. You know, lasting growth happens when, as I mentioned earlier, when we come and we live in community, when we process Jesus with, with other people. John the Baptist leads Andrew to Jesus. Andrew leads his brother Peter to Jesus. Philip leads Nathaniel to Jesus. But when Philip leads Nathaniel to Jesus, he basically says, come, let's, let's go together. In verse 46, he says, come and see, come and see. He didn't just say, go, <laughs> you go that way, right? I'm busy. He said, no, come with me, come and see. Let's, let's go see Jesus together. It's not enough sometimes to invite someone to Jesus or to church. Come to Easter. I'd love to see you. Come to Christmas service. Like these are times when people are open to come. But people are more apt to come if they, if they trust you, they'll, they'll trust where you're taking them. Does that make sense? Right? Sometimes they've heard a lot of things about church. Some of them haven't been all that great. Sometimes there's been some bad experiences. Jesus is one of the most misrepresented people on the planet. So you need to, to build a relational platform with somebody where if they trust you and you say, come and see, then they'll go, okay, I, I like you. I, I'm gonna come with you because I, I trust you. You see, God uses our friends, our relationships to lead people to him. Timothy Keller once said, you're not going to find Jesus unless you've already been found by a friend who have already found Jesus, right? It's a powerful truth. The people that, that know him are much more effective in reaching people to come and, and experience Christ for themselves because they're speaking from a, a firsthand experience like John was in his gospel. A lot of you were, were you know, found Jesus through a friend. I can look back and, and understand that, that for that lasting growth in my own life, it all happened because I connected and met other people. My life was forever changed because I encountered Jesus in other people that were like me. Imperfect people, people that didn't have it all together. Sometimes it's difficult to, to give people the feeling that you've got a bar so high that they couldn't possibly live and be the saint that you are. When you realize you're, you're no saint, come on. We understand we're all living and growing. We're imperfect people. Sometimes being a little vulnerable helps people go, if he can do it, then I can do it, right? If Pastor Paul can make it, then surely I can make it. You see, it helps to know people who are real. Our friendship has been based on the fact that, that we're honest and open and real with one another. It's exhausting talking to people that, that are wearing a mask, and yet some of them have done it for so long that now they believe it's their face when they look in the mirror, right? Because that mask has protected them. It's kept them from the hurt that, the, you know, like I can't, I talk to people all the time. They say, I, I don't know. I don't, don't know if I want to come to church because I've been hurt by people. Jesus knew that some of the greatest lessons that we will ever learn in Scripture have to be learned in community where, where the rubber hits the road. How are you going to learn what forgiveness looks like if you don't spend any time with anybody? How are you going to know what forgiveness is like until somebody does something that you don't like and you have to actually let them go? Well, I don't have to forgive anybody because I don't talk to anybody. I just watch TV and, and go home and lock the door, to let the garage door shut behind me. Listen, it's when we're around other people that we grow. 
here at Willowdale Life, much like our church back in Surrey, BC, the fastest way to grow is to connect yourself to a small group. Get involved with, with living and experiencing life with other people. Spend some time with the dream team. Give your time, give your talent. Commit to, to other people that are living on purpose, that are living with a cause. And you'll look back after a couple of years and go, I'm not the same person that I used to be. I've grown because I've spent time with, with Jesus in these other people. I need you and you need me. So let's be patient with others like John was with his disciples, but let's also be full of courage and confidence like Philip was when he invited Nathaniel to come and see. And let's not be afraid of that. Remember, your story can be one of the most life-changing things if it's used in the moments when the Holy Spirit leads you. Learn to listen to his voice. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit like never before. You need to listen because he's trying to save you a whole lot of grief. How many are married here today? Who's married? Lift up your head nice and high. Listen, if, if you are married to somebody, you know the challenges of listening, right? Like many times in my life, you know, the Holy Spirit will prompt me and I will either listen or not. And if I don't, it's to my own peril. There's been times with, with, with Susan and I where sometimes you're in a disagreement and you start, you get on this track where you're like, I'm gonna win. I'm gonna close this down. I'm gonna win. And then I can hear myself saying, oh, I got a zinger. I'm gonna say this. And I can hear the Holy Spirit saying, don't say that. And I'm like, this is so good. Like, this is gonna shut it down. This is gonna be, don't say that. I'm like, come on, just this once. Don't say it. I'm like, and I say, <laughs> and then, it's like World War III, right? But the Holy Spirit was, was already guiding me and leading me. See, the issue is not, is God still talking? But are we listening? We have to listen. To be led by the Holy Spirit is to, to be able to be obedient to what he tells you to do. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it means not winning that fight. Sometimes it means saying, I'm sorry. Ooh, I'm, I'm sorry, right? Start to practice that. You're gonna say that a few times in the course of your lifetime. Let's learn to listen to the Holy Spirit and let's seize the moment that we're in and say to this neighborhood in this city, come and see what God is doing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the power of your word. We thank you for what you're doing in and through us. Today, I pray for every person in this auditorium, understanding that there are people here that, that are, have come to a place in their life where they hear your voice. They hear you drawing them, Holy Spirit, to come and see what you want for their lives. And in the stillness of this moment, as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to step out I don't mean from your seat to come to the front. I'm not here to embarrass you today, but I want you to make a decision in your life. And so as everybody is, is in this moment of, of just reverence and honoring those around them, I wanna ask if there's those of you that, that say, Pastor Steve, I, I need to know Jesus like you're talking about, or I need to reconnect with him in a way that, that I used to know but have kind of veered away from. If that's you this morning, then everything about this service, everything about my, my time here in this city has been for you in this moment to experience the power of God in your life. And if that's you all over this auditorium, I want you to slip up your hand nice and high and say, pray for me, Pastor Steve. Include me in that prayer because today I want his will to be done and not my own. If that's you, lift it up nice and high. I wanna include you in this prayer. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. That's great. Yeah, up in the back, thank you. Yeah, over here, awesome. Yep, that's great. I see you too, up in the back left. Anybody else? I don't wanna rush through this moment. This is eternal decisions that are being made. Thank you, that's so great. All right, you can drop your hands. Now pray this prayer with me, and, and Willowdale, would you, would you pray it with those that are praying it perhaps for the first time? Let's let them know that we're standing with them today by praying this simple prayer together. Lord Jesus, 
I thank you for what you did on Calvary's cross. I thank you that you did it for me. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Lord and Savior. And help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I also pray for everyone else who's prayed that prayer many years ago, perhaps, but has found themselves through the cares of life being pulled away and distracted and pulled in a million different directions. Today, I wanna welcome you home. I wanna pray that today you'd, you'd come back to center yourself on him, that, that the, you hear his voice saying, come and see. Come and experience the goodness that I'm promising you. I pray for you today that you'd make that commitment to say that this day has been designed by God for me to return to that commitment that I've made, to put roots down in, in, in a community that is doing all that you've called them to do to, to reach out to a city with a come and see love that is based on knowing you. Lord, strengthen them, strengthen their commitment to you as we continue to grow together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.